build that building. I thought to myself, I wonder if I could design a computer someday. How do you design a computer? It was a silent quest because I was so shy, never talked to anyone, I shut my door. And I had some books that showed the chips that were available, the little building pieces of computers. And I had a book that described a computer. And I was in high school. And I sat down on paper, and I worked and worked and worked and came up with 10 pages of designs, and they were just awful and didn't add up to much. Well, a few months later, I tried it again, and eventually I got to where I could design a nifty little version of this computer, the PDP-8 from Digital Equipment Corporation. And then I discovered something amazing. I love computers so much. Where do you read about computers? I had no books. There were no, there were no magazines at the bookstore. I went down to the one place nearby that I thought would have a technical library, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, very near. I would drive on a Sunday figuring nobody would be around. I'll find the library. And I went with a friend. And we drove in and we parked by the main building. And it's really interesting. Very smart people work at Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. Wherever very smart people work, they leave doors unlocked. And we never once drove in on a Sunday, and we might have to climb some stairs, but eventually we found some door unlocked, and we'd get into the library, and I'd sit there in the dark, and I would read articles about real computers, and I would mail cards into the manufacturers, and they would send me manuals in the mail. So I was getting inundated with manuals of mini computers in the late 1960s. Mini computers from Hewlett Packard, mini computers from Varian, mini computers from Digital Equipment, even computers from IBM, I was getting the descriptions, the architectures of these computers. So every weekend I had free, I'd shut my door, pull out the latest chip manuals, and start designing that my version of that computer. And after a while, you get bored. You've already designed all the computers you have manuals for. So what did I do? I started redesigning them. I said, let's make up a little game. I made up a game in life. And the game was, how can I design the computer again but better. And better meant fewer parts. And I started working over and over, design after design after design. If I could get it down from 80 chips to 78 chips, maybe on another weekend I could get it down to 75 chips with a clever idea. A new part comes out, I got it down to 74 chips. I mean, it was just an amazing game to get the fewest parts I could. I developed all these little methods in my head of thinking ahead, visualizing lots of chips with different parts on them, combining them in the optimal ways, using parts in ways that they weren't intended, never waste a single part. If you had one little register left over, think and think and think, is there anything you can use it for that will give you something more, or save a part? So I got very good at designing these computers, and my designs were getting down to fewer chips than they shipped with. So I knew I was, had, had all these tricks that could never be written in a book, just the way my head worked, because I'd never really been trained. I taught myself, and I, I had this goal. I had to do a better job than I had done the month before. Um, finally, Data General introduced the Nova computer. The Nova computer was a very strange architecture. It was different than any other computer I'd ever seen. Instead of 30 little instructions that can do 30 different things inside the computer, the Nova had one instruction. And the instruction broke into little bits of little bits of two bits might mean which of four registers to choose for an operation. And another two bits means which of four registers for another input to that operation. And three bits might say what's the operation? Is it add? Is it subtract? Is it is it uh, complement? Is it and or or? And then other bits for carries and stuff. And by combining all those bits and those ones and zeros together in the right way, you could get almost all of the 30 normal instructions. How strange. When I went out to design this computer, I wound up with my hardware matching the architecture. A little instruction register of all these little bits of ones and zeros, and every pair of ones and zeros that went somewhere was two wires to a chip. I didn't have to design anything. <laughs> three wires at three bits that meant what's the operation? Three wires down to an operation chip. I didn't have to design anything. The, my Data General Nova wound up being half as many chips as all my other computer designs ever. Needless to say, I was shocked. And I realized that if you design the architecture of something, knowing what the parts that will build it are, and you make them match closely, that's the art. That's the art in engineering. Then you can wind up with a much better design, works just as well with half as many parts. You have to be an artist, and that really uh, inspired me. I told my father, someday 
I'm going to have a 4K Data General Nova computer. And he said, it costs as much as a house. And I was shocked. I didn't know that. So I said, well, I'll live in an apartment. <laughs> I, like many others that I didn't know, had decided that someday in my life, if at all possible, I was going to own one of these little mini computers. Now, the mini computers were big, rectangular boxes. They had switches to toggle into ones and zeros. And you could push a button and put the ones and zeros into something called memory. And then you could toggle some more ones and zeros and put them into memory. And if you, got, if you spent a half an hour, you'd have enough stuff in memory, enough ones and zeros in memory, to run a short little program of some sort. It was very awkward. My goal in a computer was to have a computer that I could sit at a keyboard, like I used to punch cards on, to have a computer I could sit at a keyboard and type in a program and run it. And that had to be, that was going to be in my life somewhere in the future. We couldn't afford it, but I was going to do it somehow. Innovation is also enriched by enjoyment of things in life. For example, when I had my ham radio, I was very special. I could reach out to other states. I could make contact with people using Morse code keys. And I felt so much more special than the other kids in school. I had my own little difference that I didn't have to be compared to. I was shy and I didn't. You don't want to be compared to people. You don't want to do the same thing as someone else and maybe they do it better. I'd rather just do these really unusual different things because then nobody's better than me for now. And once the whole world starts doing something, I'll go a different direction. Um, also, when you have these devices, when you design stuff and you have these special things in electronics that the other kids don't do, you can show them off a little bit. And if you're shy, it's good because it opens up a communication <laughs> channel. Somebody comes up and says, wow, how'd you do that? And you can start talking where you normally can't talk to people. Um, my first year at college, computer were a graduate course only. The first computer course was a graduate level course. And I was a freshman, but because I was enrolled in engineering, I was allowed to take it. And I took this graduate level course, and it was a great course on computers and operating systems and languages, and, and I got an A plus in the course, but I wrote every single program I could think of writing that would calculate numbers that are in the handbooks of chemistry and physics. I would write programs that would calculate all the Fibonacci numbers, all the powers of two, you know, factors of numbers. I had seven programs that I could run three times a day at the university, 60 pages of output each time, piling up output in my dorm room as tall as I am, and they cut off my programs. I didn't realize that back in those days, our class had a budget. So I ran the class five times over budget. And that was as much as, that was more than tuition for the school. So um, I didn't try to go back there the next year. But while I was there, electronics, you know, one of the motivations is it's fun to do things that are unusual, but sometimes it's fun to play pranks with them because other people don't know what electronics can do. So I went to a radio shack and I bought a high-speed transistor and soldered up a little transmitter on a 9-volt battery that I could hold in my hand. And I went down to the, the, the girls' dorm where they had a color TV. We'd all sit and I sat in the back and turned the control and it fuzzed up the TV set, jammed it a bit. And then a friend of mine with no prior um, arrangement whacked the TV and I made it go good. So an idea popped in my head, you know, ideas come from anything. So I, I fuzzed up the TV again and he'd whack, he'd whack it and it would go good. And after a while we trained other people, so for weeks they would sit one person next to the TV and every time it went bad it was his job to whack it or tune the fine-tuning control in those days until it worked. And he'd move his hand back and then it wouldn't work again. And so I started playing with people's bodies being a part of the formula. And I should have done this for psychology because you, I never once got caught for doing this. You know, somebody would, would you know, would, well, one time, three of them were up there fixing the TV and I made it go good because I saw a guy had his hand on the middle of the screen. And then they said, okay, it's good. And they all pulled away and he pulled his hand away. I made the TV go bad. So eventually they said, where were your bodies? Put your bodies back, wherever they were. And he put his hand on the TV and it went good. He pulled it away and it went bad. Well, he, had a, he was standing up like me and he had a foot up in the air on a chair. He put his foot on the ground and it went bad. <laughs> he put his foot back up on the chair and it went good. So he turned to the audience and he announced, it's a grounding effect. <laughs> and they watched the last half of that TV show, Mission Impossible, with a hand on the middle of the TV screen. 
And that was fun. And I had a lot of other experiences with my TV chair. The next year at college, a friend of mine had duplicated the key to the computer room. 